much um, and uh, good morning everyone uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on this historic day. 16 years ago in Dublin we had a day of welcomes as we marked the formal accession of 10 new countries into the European Union under the Irish Presidency. That day 75 million people became EU citizens and it was a transformative moment for our Union and our continent. Back then, we would never have foreseen the day that one of our member states would leave us. However, that day has arrived, and it is today. We gather to discuss Ireland and the European Union after Brexit, knowing, of course, that Brexit is still not done. We're now entering a period of transition as the negotiations commence on a new partnership, a new alliance, a new bespoke relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom. When I met with Michel Barnier on, on Monday, we were united in our belief that we will begin this new phase in a positive spirit, determined to secure the best outcome for Ireland and for the European Union and our future. So tonight, when the clock strikes 11 p.m., the United Kingdom will leave the European Union. We'll say goodbye to an old friend embarking on adventure their own tryst with destiny. We do hope it works out for them, but if it does not, there will always be a seat for the United Kingdom at the European table. As for us, I'm ambitious about the future EU-UK relationship, but I also think we need to be realistic about the dangers. We need to start this new relationship between the EU and the UK on a firm and honest footing, and that means a level playing field. This is very much in Ireland's interests, as well as that of the Union as a whole. So what does a level playing field mean? It means common minimum standards on workers' rights, health and safety, the environment, animal welfare, crucially state aids, as well as product and food standards. And has been the European norm, minimum standards that rise over time, not fall. I think this morning is an opportunity for all of us to remember what Europe stands for and where we go from here. The idea of Europe has always been inspired by a spirit of optimism and a belief in a better future. Europe allowed us here in Ireland to take our place among the nations of the world. So today is bittersweet for all of us who believe in the idea of a united Europe. Our sadness, however, is tempered by what we have seen over the past three years. And although the European Union has been tested in the past decade by the rise of populism, the financial crisis, and Brexit, it did not break. And in fact, in my view, has come through stronger and more united than ever. Today, we're particularly grateful to the European member states for their solidarity and support during the recent Brexit negotiations. And I'm glad to see some EU ambassadors here today and I hope you'll convey our words of thanks back to your capitals. What we saw over the past three years is proof positive that small countries benefit from, from membership of the European Union. We don't get swallowed up. Rather, we are partners. So this morning is an opportunity to remember what United Europe stands for as we imagine the Europe of the future. The ideals of European unity freedom, peace and solidarity, are perhaps best expressed in the words of Schiller, put to music by Beethoven, proclaiming our shared values and our unity and diversity. They suggest that the abiding friendship can transcend human frailties and weaknesses and help us to achieve something much greater. I'm struck by the fact that over the past few years, we've seen again the power of an abiding friendship in action a friendship that brought peace, reconciliation and prosperity to Europe and has helped to protect peace here in Ireland as we went through this first difficult phase of Brexit. The UK leaving is not a cause of celebration for us. There will be no issuing of commemorative coins for this event. But we do celebrate the solidarity that has been shown by our EU partners and we say thank you to our fellow Europeans. Over the past two and a half years, I've travelled across Europe, meeting fellow heads of state and government to discuss Brexit and the challenges it has brought to the island of Ireland. 
I think I've been in every Prime Minister's office at this stage, and if I haven't been in theirs, they've been in mine. And I'll never forget the reaction of the people I met, those who inquired every time we met about the progress of Brexit, what I thought would happen next, and wondered what it would mean for my country. Those who worried about peace on the island of Ireland, those who came here to visit the border area, and the kindness of those who shared our concern and wished us well. And I have to say, I was humbled by their generosity of spirit and the evidence in every European city of how international interests had replaced narrow national ones. So today we say thank you to the European leaders in our member states and also to the EU institutions, the Parliament, the Council and the Commission, who made Irish concerns their own and stood with us to achieve a deal that protects the hard-earned peace on the island of Ireland. We say thank you to the people of Europe who understood our fears and took our hopes and concerns into their own hearts. European unity started as an idea. It became a dream and then became reality. The solidarity and abiding friendship we've received over the past three years is further proof that that European dream is durable. It can withstand whatever is thrown at it and it is strengthened by coming through trials together. And with the ongoing rise of populism and nationalism in many European countries, there will be more trials in the future, I believe. As Taoiseach, I've seen the strength and unity of the European Union and how much we can achieve when all member states, all 27 of us, think together, work together and have common objectives and goals. When Europe acts as one, it is a truly powerful force for good in the world. United we stand, but divided we achieve little. So the next step is to negotiate a future relationship, including a free trade <coughs> agreement between the European Union, including Ireland, and the UK, one that protects jobs, businesses, rural and coastal communities, and our economies generally. The UK would like to see a trade deal this year, and I believe that is possible, particularly if the new trade deal brings about arrangements that are very similar to the current ones. It will be difficult, though. But in the withdrawal agreement, there is an option that the Joint Committee can agree an extension if needs be. Now, I know the British government has ruled that out, but it is still there in the withdrawal agreement should the British government and the EU come together in a Joint Committee and decide that an extension is needed. On our side, we know it's going to be a pretty rocky couple of months. The European Council at the end of March is going to be crucial in that regard, and we need to get down to business very quickly, trying to get the trade deal which is essential for the Irish economy, and of course for Britons. We want free trade with the UK, with no tariffs, no taxes, no quotas, and as little bureaucracy and as few checks as possible. But no matter what happens, there will be some bureaucracy and there will be checks, because things cannot be as they were before. I'm adamant that our future partnership with the UK must go beyond trade. It needs to cover a broad range of issues, including fisheries, for example, security, our universities, cooperation on research and economics generally. I'm confident that we can get a good deal. And the good news is that I don't think the two parties are actually that far apart further apart in rhetoric than in substance. The EU on the one hand, and Britain on the other, broadly agree that we want there to be no quotas, no tariffs, no taxes, and the minimum amount of bureaucracy and checks possible. And that's really important in Ireland for our exporters, our businesses, our agri-food sector, our rural economy, our coastal communities, and the 200,000 people in all parts of Ireland whose jobs depend on trade with the UK. However, we have to be realistic about the dangers as well. A failure to secure a trade deal would be a major threat and an existential threat to our economy in 2021. So we do need that deal. The whole idea of a level playing field is important because there's a genuine concern across the European Union that part of the motivation behind Brexit, or at least for some people who are behind Brexit, was for the UK to undercut us or outbid us in terms of state aids, environmental standards, labour standards, product standards, food standards, 
and all of those things. When I met with Prime Minister Johnson in Belfast recently, he reassured me that this was not the case, that that was not the kind of United Kingdom that he wanted to lead as Prime Minister. But we need that written down in law so that there aren't misunderstandings in future. And we need a mechanism to adjudicate disputes and enforce those adjudications. Today, I think, is also an opportunity to reflect, to think a little bit beyond Brexit, and to think about the future of our European Union. Past generations, I believe, knew instinctively that, that a united Europe was a good idea. They knew it could bring an end to centuries of war in our continent, that it provided a pathway for peace, democracy, and the rule of law, for free markets and prosperity after the horrors of World War II. Particularly those who lived on continental Europe said no more war, and the European Union allowed France and Germany and other states to put aside generations of conflict in favour of cooperation. And for those who lived behind the Iron Curtain in Central and Eastern Europe, the European Union was always the light, the hope, the possibility that communism could be defeated and democracy, the rule of law and the social market economy brought to their countries too. But for younger people, those younger than me, the horrors of world war and the evils of fascism and communism are not in their memory. So to make sure that the next generation continues to hold to that belief in European unity, we need to make sure that Europe has a new project, a new raison d'etre for the future. And I believe that can be by dealing with those challenges that can only be overcome by collective multilateral action. Climate action is first among those, but others, others include things like security, for example, and the regulation and taxation of large companies, many of which are now larger and more powerful than nation states. In my conversations with President von der Leyen, I've commended her on, her on the leadership she's shown when it comes to the European Green Deal, and assured her that she will have a friend and ally in Ireland in driving that forward. I believe that the European Green Deal isn't just a good environmental policy, it's also a really good economic policy as well. And we should strive as a European Union to be among the first to adopt new technologies, and more importantly, to be the people who invent them. It has the potential to unlock a new wave of investment, innovation, entrepreneurship, to provide the economic opportunity of tomorrow. We face global crises, and will be judged in the future by the decisions that we take today. And I endorse the objective of a climate neutral EU by 2050. And we must now ensure that the new EU budget and the work of the European Investment Bank and other bodies is directed towards achieving that goal. This action will help create an opportunity for green grow growth, new jobs, new businesses, and a cleaner, more biodiverse environment. The transition to a climate neutral Europe will require significant public and private investment. And we're supportive of the plan by the European Investment Bank to invest a trillion euros in climate action and sustainability between 2021 and 2030. There will also need to be a just transition mechanism to assist the regions and industries most affected, regions like our own Midlands, which will be affected as we move out of peat harvesting and burning peat for energy, places like West Clare, but also individuals in particular roles. And while jobs may become redundant as a consequence of climate action, people should never become redundant. We must ensure that they have good severance packages and the opportunity for retraining and new jobs and better jobs in the new economy. Over the coming weeks and months, we'll also have to agree a new EU budget for the next seven years, the MFF. As a country, we want to see long-established, well-functioning and successful policies, such as the Common Agricultural Policy, CAP, Cohesion, Horizon, Interreg, and Erasmus Plus to be funded well. We also recognise the need for investment in meeting newer challenges, such as migration, security, and of course, climate action. And we want to make sure that there's a dedicated funding stream within the European Green Deal for farmers to encourage them and pay them to do the right thing by our environment. We all know that Europe can and does make a difference 
For example, we have an agreement already on a special allocation for a Peace Plus programme worth about 100 million euros for Northern Ireland and the border counties. I think we can push that up a little bit higher. And when you add in contributions from the Irish government and the UK government, it could leverage a package of investment for Northern Ireland and our border counties worth as much as a billion euros over seven years. And that would be a considerable boost, I think, to Northern Ireland and to the border. So what have we learned from the first phase of Brexit? First, I think we've learned a lot about ourselves, about the quality of our diplomats and our officials in Ireland and in embassies and consulates across Europe, the quality of institutions such as this uh, and other bodies, unions, employers groups that studied Brexit and followed it closely, the quality of our media who reported Brexit so well. We've also learned about the value of having the right team and I hear, I hope you'll join with me in paying tribute to the work of the Taunishta, Simon Coveney, and Minister McEntee is here as well. But I think most of all, we've learned a lot about our friends in Europe. As the leader of a small country, I felt enormous solidarity from our European partners. So often we were told that the day would come when the big countries would get together and tell us what's what. It never did. Or that I'd be called into a room on a dark night and be told to sacrifice our tax policies or something else in return for solidarity. Not only did that never happen, it was never even hinted at. Sometimes people in small countries believe that by joining a larger union, they can get swallowed up. I think the past few years have demonstrated again that the European Union is a union of nations, as well as a union of peoples, one in which small states are protected and respected. And being at the heart of the European Union doesn't make us one scintilla less Irish. I do profoundly regret that the UK is leaving, but I absolutely respect their decision to do so. I'm certain that no matter what, both we, both Ireland and the EU more broadly, will continue to have an abiding relationship with our nearest neighbour, the UK. A real partnership in terms of politics, security and the economy into the future. Our objectives as Ireland and Europe for the first phase of Brexit have been met. Citizens' rights are protected for those EU citizens living in the UK and for UK citizens living in the European Union. We have a financial settlement. There'll be no hard border on the island of Ireland. The all-island economy will continue to develop and north-south cooperation, as envisaged by the Good Friday Agreement, can continue to thrive. We've also secured the integrity of the single market and our place in it. To reach an agreement, both sides showed flexibility and both sides were prepared to compromise at crucial points in time. We each took a leap of faith and trusted in the other to help us to achieve our aims. And I believe this has to be a good sign for the next phase of negotiations, our future relationship and of things to come. It shows how inspiring the words of the anthem of Europe have become a reality for us in the 21st century. So I look forward with confidence to the future of Ireland and the EU after Brexit. And I do not underestimate the challenges and the risks. But I believe we can meet those challenges and rise to them by working with our European partners. And we can build an ever closer, safer, more prosperous and sustainable future for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Taoiseach. I'm now going to open these proceedings to the floor and I'll take the person there. Name? Yeah. Uh, Roland Tynan, a filmmaker and member of the Institute. Uh, Taoiseach, I just want to ask you about promoting European values and human rights, which you spoke very eloquently about there. Yesterday, standing in the same position that you are now, I asked Michal Martin, would he allow his Minister for Foreign Affairs to go to Russia, as Minister Coveney did, and smiling talk about increasing trade with Russia, when, as you're well aware, the EU has sanctioned Russia over the annexation of Crimea, the invasion of the Ukraine, and those sanctions were strengthened, as you're aware, when the Russians shot down MH17, a Malaysian passenger airliner, in which 300 people were killed. But Taoiseach, at that time, which is the reason that I was really upset about that... Ronan, the, I think you're coming to a question. Oh yeah, question. The question is, Taoiseach, at that time, uh, Taoiseach, uh, the Russians were bombing hospitals in Syria. And 
the minister could not have been unaware of that fact. And I would put it to you as a medical doctor. Do you have any words of support and solidarity with medical doctors being bombed in Syria, doing the job you did? And I would put it to you as well. Would you not feel a deep sense of betrayal if you had seen Minister Lavrov smi or Minister Coveney smiling with Lavrov at a time when they are watching their colleagues being murdered and wounded, doing those life-saving jobs that they have in the most dangerous place on earth? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think you started your question uh, by talking about European values, and I think sometimes people misinterpret the term uh, European values or European way of life. Uh, seeing it as some sort of superior thing or, or almost European nationalist uh, concept. It, it's not really. Uh, like for me, uh, the European continent is different from other parts of the world. And we do have distinct European values. Uh, we have the European social market economy. Uh, that's not the way America works. America is an unbridled free market economy. China has a form of state capitalism. Um, we're a continent that believes in equality between men and women, not the norm in most of the world a continent that believes that democracy and the rule of law uh, are the norm. Uh, and that is not the case uh, in much of the world, including Russia, um, which doesn't subscribe to European values, in my view. Uh, it's not a social market economy. Uh, it doesn't respect uh, equality, uh, not least for people who are uh, LGBT. Uh, it is not a functioning democracy uh, and doesn't abide by the rule of law. And for those reasons, we have to be unafraid uh, and challenging countries like Russia, some of the countries in the Middle East, uh, in other parts of the world that don't ascribe to these values. Um, but I don't believe in a policy of boycott. Um, we have sanctions on Russia, sanctions that we've renewed, and I supported renewing them. Um, but I don't believe a policy of boycott would work, uh, and that means engagement. Uh, so yes, we will engage with Russia into the future, but not for a second does that mean us turning a blind eye uh, or failing to raise with them uh, our objections to what's happening in Ukraine, um, what's happening in Syria, uh, or the violation of human rights within that country itself. Thank you. Question over there. I can possibly don't need the mic one. Uh, Blair Horn, uh, member of the Institute. Uh, thanks very much, Teresa, Teresa, for your presentation. Just on the level playing field conditions, I mean, some of the speculation has been that in areas like state aid and environmental policy, it might be. Uh, dynamic <coughs> rather than non-regression. I'm just wondering, in the overall scheme, including in terms of social and employment policy, is the Irish position that it should be dynamic employment on all the level playing field conditions, or what areas are you possibly talking about non-regression? Just the Irish position, just to say, particularly incident, uh, dynamic alignment mm. on social and employment policy as well as the other areas. Yeah, the, the, like, like the Irish position will be that, uh, that what we want is dynamic alignment uh, rather than non-aggression. I think the UK would agree to non-aggression, non-regression, rather than non-aggression, <laughs> but non-regression. Uh, uh, um, non um, and you know, some, something, something Prime Minister Johnson says to me, and you know, it's absolutely a fair comment, he says, uh, you know, do you really think that a, you know, a wealthy, prosperous Western European country like the UK is going to have lower uh, wages than, say, Bulgaria or Romania? And you know, of course they're not. Um, so it's not so much a concern around uh, re um, regression that we would have in that area, um, but it is that over time um, that we could become disaligned uh, because European standards tend to rise. You, you know, if, if you look at one of the best things the European Union has achieved, instead of race to the bottom unfair competition among member states that gets corrected for through tariffs and barriers, uh, we've set a common set of minimum standards in lots of areas but they're rising standards. Uh, and you, you know, the, the Gothenburg Pact and the European social policy, all these things, the social chapter, are all part of that. And by agreeing a set of common standards, they can rise. And there is a risk that the UK um, may depart from that. Uh, and so, so my, like it doesn't have to be absolute, but my, my overall idea of a level playing field would be one of common minimum standards that continue to rise. Um, so that is, I suppose, another way of saying uh, dynamic alignment. And we do need to bear in mind that the UK is not Canada. Um, you know, the kind of undercutting and unfair competition um, that could happen with the UK is quite different. You know, Canada is very far away. Um, and there's a big ocean in between. So I think we need to bear that in mind when it comes to the next set of talks. Uh, yes, the new trade deal might resemble Canada. 
um, but Canada is not the UK. Uh, the UK is right here on our doorstep uh, and it's 60 million people, so it is different. Thank you. There's a question down at the back there, I'm told. Thank you, Tishuk, and thank you to the IAF for hosting this very important um, uh, discussion. My name is Selena Donnelly. I work with Trokra. Um, we work overseas with communities that are experiencing the worst impacts of the climate cri crisis that it, they have contributed the least to. Um, I was very glad to hear you prioritise the need for collective action on our climate and biodiversity crisis. Um, my question is, uh, if re-elected, um, Will you ensure that Ireland um, immediately joins the group of EU member states that are calling for an increase in the EU's 2030 climate targets to at least 55%, aiming for 65% reductions in line with the latest findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and deliver an 8% a year annual reduction in emissions in the lifetime of the next government? Thank you. Um, uh, to, to, get, to, give you, to give you a straight answer, I, I, it's not a straight answer. I'm going to give you an answer of yes and no. Um, uh, yes, we're absolutely uh, part of the group of European countries that wants to show more ambition on climate action. Uh, we're among the EU states that have signed up to being uh, carbon neutral or climate neutral by, by 2050. Um, in our own climate action plan, we're predict, predict, predicting or planning for a reduction in our own emissions of somewhere between 2 and 3% a year. Um, and we set out in the Climate Action Plan how we believe that can be achieved. Um, now, that is being challenged. Uh, you know, the main opposition party is saying to us that uh, our targets are not realistic, particularly when it comes to electric vehicles. Now, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think it is possible to get to a million electric vehicles by 2030. I've seen how quickly new technologies like smartphones get adapted. You know, it's not a straight line curve. It goes like this, you know. Almost nobody has one than everyone does. You know, take WhatsApp, for example. I'd say every family in Ireland has a WhatsApp group at this stage, or every second one does. Almost nobody did a few years ago. Um, but the point I'm getting to is we've set a target uh, of reducing our emissions by 2 to 3% a year, which would uh, be enough to honour our obligations under the Paris Accords. And we just about know how we're going to do that. Um, and people are critical of how we think we can do it. They're actually saying that when you break down that 2 or 3% to actual things like the number of electrical vehicles that were being overambitious. Um, so how could I commit to 7 or 8% without knowing? We just about know how to do 2 or 3. How can you commit to 7 or 8 until you actually have some good idea as to how you'd actually achieve that? And 8% a year over the period of uh, a government, assuming it goes full term, is a 40% reduction in, in emissions. Uh, I think it would be absolutely desirable and right uh, to aim for that and achieve it. But before you could commit to that in law or in a genuine, meaningful way, you'd have to be able to show how you do it. And you'd have to understand what the impact would be on people's livelihoods um, and on their jobs and on poverty. And nobody who's asked me so far to sign up to a 7 or 8% um, target per annum or 40% over five years has been able to show me even a three or four page document that shows how that can be done uh, and what the impact would be on our society. Thank you, Zisha. There's a question over there. Uh, thank you, uh, Zisha. Um, There's a microphone coming for you there. Thank you. Uno Dwyer, member of the Institute. Uh, yesterday here, Michal Martin uh, stressed the importance of connecting Europe and its citizens and some years ago at the IIEA meeting in Brussels that you, uh, to which you spoke, I also asked you about communicating Europe. Uh, what are in the present atmosphere of populism and difficulties between, uh, for example, in particular, uh, the EU and um, the UK, what are your suggestions for the future on not just communicating Europe at European level and in, uh, also at national level, but also connecting Europe with its citizens. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think that, that's, that's a very good question. I think there is, there is still a perception that um, the European Union in many ways is remote from citizens um, and elitist. I don't think that's fair, but that's the way the European Union is often perceived, uh, more so in other countries than, uh, um, than in this one. Um, one of the things we have done in Ireland, which I think has been as successful, is the Citizens' Dialogues, which have been led by Minister McEntee. Uh, we're now talking 
at a European level of having a sort of convention, uh, on another convention, if you like, or Citizens' Assembly, if you like, on the future of Europe. And I think that's a good idea, done on a pan-European basis. Um, it's avoiding uh, another IGC or another um, Convention on the Future of Europe in that sense, but not ruling it out because treaty change um, may well be necessary at some point in the future, but the purpose wouldn't be treaty change. The purpose would be to engage with citizens across Europe and see what kind of Europe that they want, uh, they want from us. Um, but I do think sometimes small things matter. Uh, you know, the kind of things that people really identify with as European citizens you know, is the fact that with that Burgundy passport, um, that that European citizenship gives you enormous freedom. Uh, the freedom to travel anywhere in the EU without needing a visa, the freedom to study anywhere in the EU, the freedom to work anywhere in the EU. Uh, and that's an enormous uh, right uh, that I think people become more aware of uh, as UK citizens um, lose it, and we need to remind them of that. Um, but it's other things as well. You know, again, just talking to everyday people, it's things like the roaming charges. Probably one of the best things that the European Parliament did and the European Union did was get rid of roaming charges, something really practical. Um, and one of the things, uh, another thing, of course, is programmes like Erasmus. I think they say now that there are about 1.1 million Erasmus babies across the European Union. Uh, you know, people who met, met, their, met, their, met their partner or, or the father or mother of their child, if not their partner, um, uh, on Erasmus. Uh, you know, so some of those programmes are really powerful. Uh, one of the ones, and I know it gets criticised, but I think it's a really powerful one, um, that has been initiated now is, is the interrail pass for young people uh, and giving them that opportunity to uh, travel around Europe when they're 17 or 18 or 19, you know, that kind of, those kind of formative years. So I think it's, it's things in that space that we need to do a little bit more of. But if you have suggestions, I'm really open to it because it's something that we've grappled with for a very long time now. Um, you know, we all celebrated the fact that the turnout in the European elections wasn't, you know, wasn't awful. Um, but like it wasn't great either, you know, um, across the European Union. And it's disappointing that when the European Union is so important uh, that there is disengagement. Um, I, I used to like the idea of a directly elected president of the European Union, but I've become more sceptical about that. Um, but I still like the idea of transnationalists, uh, people actually voting in European elections, not just for their local MEP or their MEP from their region, but also uh, voting for a panel um, on a transnational list, and that might require us to have uh, a conversation about which European political party you'd support. Um, be an experiment, uh, but that's not not on the cards just yet. But there is there is some support for it anyway. Taoiseach, what I what is on the cards is that from tomorrow, uh, the informal but constant relationship that we have had, particularly with our nearest neighbour, Great Britain, because of joint membership of the European Union, will no longer exist. Uh, it's clear that Britain itself, and England in particular, is still <coughs> suffering from this departure in so many different ways. Would you consider it an initiative that should be taken by the Irish side and by you as Taoiseach, or your successor, to construct a new relationship to fill that gap so that the uh, way in which we have interacted for the last uh, many, many years, since 1973, that relationship no longer exists? Mm. Uh, how would you propose to try and fill that gap? You mean between Britain and Ireland? Between Britain and Ireland. Yeah, so something I, I, I've, I've given some thought to, and um, uh, I've spoken to Prime Minister May about it before, uh, and uh, more recently with Prime Minister Johnson, um, and it is going to be a big change. Uh, you know, we joined the European Union together with the UK. Um, they're leaving, we're staying. It was kind of heading that way for a long time in a weird way. You know, I think that the ultimate decision that we made as a country when we voted for the Maastricht Treaty, the decision to join the Euro without them. Like, that was pretty fundamental. Uh, we went into the Euro, uh, they didn't. Um, and I don't think it was as big, a, I don't think it was as a fundamental decision as we thought at the time, but it turned out to be a pretty fundamental decision. It's one thing to leave a European Union, it's another thing to leave a currency union. Um, and, you know, that decision is made that we're going in one direction and uh, sadly they're going another, but that really started, I think, with Maastricht uh, and Brexit is just, um, the, 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 the next manifestation of that. It is extraordinary how much things have changed in the UK, that at that time there was a serious debate as to whether the, 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 the UK would join the euro or not, um, how much things have changed uh, in, in that country. Um, but it does require us to do two things. At a European level, we're losing a, a really like-minded country yes. that had similar ideas and views to us on lots of issues, trade, tax, 
um, the transatlantic relationship, you name it. Uh, and that means building new alliances. Uh, and we're doing that very effectively already, particularly with uh, what we call the Nordic Baltic group, um, the Nordic countries and the three Baltic states uh, who are small open trading economies, a bit like ours, also a little bit worried about the UK leaving uh, and what that will mean for the European Union. Uh, and that works very, very well on fin finance minister's level already. Uh, and we do it uh, in a slightly looser arrangement um, uh, at, uh, at head of government level. Um, and one of the things I've been invited to in October is a meeting of the Nordic Baltic Council. I um, hope I'll be in situ to attend, but I think it is significant that, that Ireland has been invited to attend the, 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 the Nordic Baltic meeting. Um, and one of the explanations given to me as to why we were invited um, by the Prime Minister of Estonia, Yuri Ratas, is, is hosting it, uh, is, is, you know, you don't have the UK anymore, so, you know, we don't want you to be on your own in the room, you know, you might need, <laughs> you might need new friends, you know. Um, so I think that there's a potential alliance for us to build there. Uh, but, you know, there are other alliances too that are important, particularly with France, around our nearest neighbour now in the European Union, as of tonight, um, uh, particularly around agriculture and other issues where we're very aligned, uh, and also a lot of the Mediterranean countries. So there are lots of alliances we can build up. It's going to take a lot of work. We will need to expand our diplomatic presence in all of those countries. But I'm not answering your question. Your question is about Ireland and, and Britain. So to, to answer your question, um, we've had some discussions about this already. Uh, and I think what we can do and should do uh, is to use the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement, um, which were really prophetic in so many ways. Uh, so one of the first things I reread when I became Taoiseach was the Good Friday Agreement. And um, it's a visionary document. Um, it doesn't read like an international treaty at all. It's an extraordinary extraordinary to read it um, and it of course talks about what what they talked about at the time as the totality of relationships not just power sharing in Northern Ireland and north-south cooperation but also cooperation in the east-west context and there's the two institutions there the British Irish Council which involves Scotland and Wales and and uh, Channel Islands and Isle of Man but also the BWIGC uh, the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference which has been underused uh, in the past and um, Boris Johnson talks about beefing that up uh, and I think that's the right approach too, uh, that we uh, use that institution that already exists in the Good Friday Agreement uh, and strengthen it uh, and use it as the um, pivot around which we can strengthen uh, relations between Ireland and Britain. Uh, perhaps, you know, meeting in a planned way, maybe every six months, maybe one thing I've suggested is, is, is that Every year, we have like a, almost like a joint cabinet meeting uh, between the British cabinet and the Irish cabinet. The French and Germans have been doing this for ages. Uh, we could do something like that, uh, and that will help to cement uh, the relationship. The other thing is, is expanding our own presence uh, in the UK, which has happened already. Uh, we've reopened the consulate in Cardiff, which had been closed during the crash, uh, and we're going to open one in the north of England. Uh, haven't decided yet whether it'll be Liverpool or Manchester, uh, but again, strengthening that relationship too. Ishik, you've been very generous with your time, and I know you have a busy schedule, but there is one more question that has been put, I gather, from the floor. Do we have a question? You could indicate your name. Uh, Shavelle Toner, uh, thanks Taoiseach for coming. Uh, you talk about the importance of the Erasmus programme and how it is important for Irish students to go abroad, but it also is important for students from Europe to come to Ireland but with increasing costs for that, with rents being atrocious at the moment, travel expenses for students, just everything, Susie, not increasing. How do you plan to attract these students with our institutions becoming more overcrowded and receiving less funding? Yeah, well, we, we, are, we are actually attracting a, a lot of international students to, to Ireland. I don't know the exact figures, but um, uh, there's been a substantial increase in uh, the number of international students um, coming to Ireland, not all from the European Union by, by any means. Uh, I think one of the pluses, one of the silver linings, if you like, from Brexit um, uh, is, is that more Irish students might choose to do their Erasmus year not in the UK. Now, it's possible that the UK will stay in Erasmus, but if it doesn't, uh, we might see more Irish students uh, studying in Spain and France and Italy. I think that would be a plus and would probably help to improve our language competencies as well. And perhaps we'll have more interest um, from EU students in coming to Irish universities rather than British ones, particularly those who want to perfect their English. Uh, Irish universities might become even more attractive than, than they are now. Um, but the point you make is, is a very valid one around the cost of, of being a student here in Ireland. 
um, and not just the cost of education, but also the cost of travel and housing, which is impacting uh, on, on, our, on our own citizens as much as it does on mm. students coming here to visit. Um, actual funding for universities, I think, has gone up by about 25% over the past three or four years. It hasn't been cut. I know the number of students has got, gone up as well, but I often hear that, that, that said that funding for higher level has been cut. It hasn't. Uh, it's gone up about 25%, I think, in the last couple of years. And we also have 300 million set aside from the surplus in the uh, National Training Fund uh, for that, and that's there to be uh, deployed. Um, in our own manifesto, we have committed to increasing the thresholds for SUSE so that more people uh, will qualify for um, uh, the student grant. Uh, we're also proposing that there should be no increase uh, in the student registration fee over the course of the next five years, which uh, I hope would give um, uh, some reassurance to people around costs. Uh, and as well as that, I think when it comes to accommodation, what we really need is to support our universities to build a lot more on-site accommodation. Uh, there's a huge amount of student accommodation being built uh, in all our cities. Uh, it's cropping up everywhere. Uh, it's very welcome that we have it um, because it is freeing up uh, housing and rental properties for others. Uh, but it's also generally very expensive uh, and most of the people in it um, are international students um, who must be relatively well off because they're able to afford it. Um, and that's not a criticism of student accommodation uh, or international students by any means, but it's not providing the low cost, cost rental type accommodation that we should be having, uh, and that should be happening on our campuses. Uh, and when I visited campuses uh, all over Ireland, from ITs to universities, they all seem to have plenty of land, or a decent amount of land, uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, so I think one of the things that we should do in the next government uh, having tried out cost rental on publicly owned sites like the Enniscary Road and going to do it in Emmett Road, uh, one of the obvious places where we could really make a big impact on cost rental uh, is by building uh, accommodation on the campuses of our ITs and universities, uh, thus providing uh, accommodation for students at a lower rent, but then that also affecting the market and, and requiring the market off campus to respond to that by not increasing rents or having lower rents as well. Ishik, thank you very, very much indeed. <clears throat> I'm informed that you now have other commitments to make and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Nice story. Thank you.